Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I am Ian Bradley, Investments Analyst at Foundation for the Carolinas, and I will be the host of today's webinar. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Please note that all participants will be muted and video will be disabled. However, if at any time during the webinar you have a question or would like further clarification on a topic, we invite you, we invite you to send your questions to Foundation for the Carolinas in the chat window. The Mercer team will address these questions during the Q&A portion of the webinar. If we don't get to your questions during the session, we'll be sure to follow up with you after the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be added to the My FFTC portal under resources should you desire to access these materials again. Thank you again for joining us today and I now turn it over to Greg Burris, our VP and Director, Investments Portfolio Oversight and Reporting. Greg. All right, thank you, Ian, and hello, everyone. Um, on behalf of FFTC's entire executive team, I want to extend a sincere thanks to all of you for your relationship with Foundation for the Carolinas. And of course, thank you for attending the webinar. I will now uh, turn it over to Travis Pruitt and Tim Westrich. They are our co-consultants uh, from Mercer. Travis will be leading the discussion uh, covering market conditions uh, as well as covering uh, individual pool performance um, across the FFTC investment pools. Thank you, Travis. Great, thanks, Greg, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, hopefully, uh, you're re your repeat uh, joiners, so it's nice to have you back. I hope all is well with all of you. So, as Greg said, we'll go through some market positioning uh, in terms of re results up to this point. Uh, we will uh, go through. Uh, uh, some of our current views on the marketplace and what that means to the portfolios and ultimately we'll go through performance uh, and give you a sense of where we stand. So with that, let's dive right in. Uh, for the first quarter of 2021, really pretty solid, absolute performance. As the vaccine rollouts continue, as we generally stay on a positive trend, certainly with, with, with not without setbacks around the world in terms of recovering from the pandemic, uh, we did see a really pretty solid uh, equity, strong equity returns uh, for the first quarter. So the S&P 500 up about 6%. Uh, you can see the other, some of the other categories up there, uh, you know, emerging markets up about two, developed markets as defined by EFA up about three and a half. So pretty solid performance on a quarterly basis for equities after, uh, if you will, continuing the strength that we saw coming out of last year's numbers. In March to March is pretty much the bottom to top of the cycle. We have uh, March 23rd of 2020 was the absolute low date. So we're really looking at about 12 full months of recovery now. And you can see that that's meant uh, quite substantial returns on the upside, uh, capturing that. So S&P 500 up about 56 and a half, emerging markets up a little bit more. Uh, and also that, that ebullience or that focus on recovery has also led rates to move up. So while the short end of the curve very short-term rates like money market rates continue to be very low. Uh, we have seen rates uh, out the maturity curve, 5, 10, 30 years. We have seen those rates go up. And as you know, uh, or may recall, when rates go up, the total return on bonds goes down. So we did see the, the Barclays aggregate bond universe finish down a bit uh, on a quarterly basis. If we dive a little bit deeper into those numbers, we can see that uh, the shape of the recovery remains focused on those stocks or companies that are most heavily leveraged towards economic recovery. So in the first quarter, we saw natural resource stocks lead the way up nearly 20% for the three-month period. Uh, along those lines, we've seen oil and natural gas also accelerate, so that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, if we move, return to economic growth, natural resource stocks seem to, to, to be right there on the front front lines for leverage. Small and mid-cap stocks, uh, next strongest for the category. Again, also companies that are more sensitive to changes in economic direction, overall uh, performed really pretty well. Uh, when we look a little closer, we'd see the international stocks, which I talked about briefly, uh, up only about three and a half percent amongst international developed markets. We did see the dollar, uh, regain a bit of strength in the first quarter. The dollar had weakened against foreign currencies through much of the back half of last year, and that helped absolute returns for international stocks versus U.S. stocks 
uh, be more uh, closely aligned, but we did see that reverse a little bit here in the uh, in the first quarter. And so that is a when the dollar strengthens, it is a bit of a, a negative uh, to uh, the total returns, the absolute returns for non-U.S. equities. And then we did see bonds pretty much across the board sell off in the quarter uh, as rates moved up. Uh, investment grade corporate bonds, which have been key to the overall performance of uh, of your fixed income assets uh, over the last year, they did sell off just a bit more than treasuries, but really, it, it really pretty much in line with the activity of the bond market, uh, suggesting that it was really just a generalized shift in rates as investors begin to, to, to think about and price in the concepts of uh, continued recovery and what that might mean on several fronts. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. As I mentioned, the one-year trailing performance is pretty much bottom to top. And so th those more cyclically oriented uh, securities have done extraordinarily well. These, these are the types of numbers that you see you know, once in a generation uh, or at least once in a multi-cycle. And so small mids up nearly 90% on a one on a year over year basis. Natural resource stocks really rebounding significantly up 72%. You can see there's pretty much not a is just a couple of negative returns on a year over year basis on our chart here by the broad asset classes. And you can see primarily it's those that are that are just exposed to interest rate risk in the forms of treasuries and long treasuries at the bottom of the curve. But even broader investment grade bonds, uh, I didn't circle it this time, but up uh, around 8.7% over the trailing one year period, uh, reflecting overall strength of economic recovery as a as a growth sensitive uh, asset just a little bit more depth here so we just talked we talked about small mids outperformed it had been some time since small and mid cap stocks had outperformed large cap stocks in the us uh, we also saw that shift towards more value oriented securities so you can see regardless of the capitalization for the quarter whether it be large cap there at the top of the chart or mid or small caps as you move down uh, value did tend to perform better. Uh, again, value stocks had performed very poorly versus the broader market for uh, up until call it the end of the third quarter for probably the better part of two or three years. Uh, and the challenges they had had accelerated over that time. With the introduction of the vaccine in early November, uh, the uh, you saw market participants start to get much more comfortable with those companies that had much more leverage, maybe weren't as strong a balance sheets, but were much more tuned to the, uh, they were much more tuned to the, the, the tone and direction of the economic environment. So we see that in the value indices. If we look at those over uh, the last year, uh, you can see even more dramatic dramatically down at the smallest parts of the marketplace, the Russell 2000 growth and 2000 value. 2000 value squeaked ahead just a little bit over that 12 month period, but up nearly 100% off of their bottom uh, over that time. Interestingly, I don't have it in this deck, uh, but I did yesterday, I was taking a look at these numbers similarly for, um, for a client and the spreads of growth and value through the end of March, when you look at three year and longer periods are still quite dramatic, uh, very, very wide, still positive to growth uh, in terms of returns. So it is nice to see the market balancing out. Uh, we see this as healthy and a broader participation we think is good overall uh, for investors in general. And then finally, we do own quality and, and some lower volatility exposure in the portfolios. You can see it didn't perform quite as well over the trailing 12 months as some of the other categories. Uh, that's a, that's a negative in terms of relative performance for us. But fortunately, as you'll see, we overcame most of that uh, in, the, in the period. We do like quality and minimum volatility or low volatility stocks as a long-term portion of the portfolio. Uh, and this is exactly the kind of period that we saw where we would expect them to underperform. When we look a little bit more broadly and we think about, okay, that's where we were, where are we going? We do think that uh, our we've had the view for a while that it would be uh, end of 2021 into 2022 before we saw a uh, return to trend. That is generally where we still sit today, although the slope of our of our expectation line or the consensus forecast line has gotten a little bit sleeper. And uh, there is a chance that we could be back to pre-COVID trend 
U.S. economic growth by the end of 2021. And maybe, you know, if things go extraordinarily well, maybe we'll be back to trend even before the end of the calendar year. Uh, that is our baseline view. You know, anytime, anytime you have a baseline view, there are some risks to it. Certainly, uh, I live in a county that has rolled back some of its openness as, uh, as infection rates have gone back up in the short term. I think you'll, you know, you will see that, I think, periodically or episodically, maybe is a better word, around the country and around the world. Uh, so that will, you know, that will create short-term, hopefully short-term uh, chuck holes uh, in, the, in this line. Uh, and certainly what's going on in places like India today, where they are suffering under uh, a pretty significant outbreak of the COVID virus. And it's having a really meaningful impact on their country overall, as, and clearly as, as per their economy. So we're not, we're not virologists, but uh, certainly the, the rotating instances of COVID suggest it's not over uh, and it won't be over tomorrow where there still is some road ahead. But our basic view is that we would anticipate that economic growth overall uh, will be you know, close to back on track uh, by the end of this year or early into next year. Uh, that recovery strength has led the bond market, as we've talked about a little bit already, to, to price in uh, some ramifications of stronger growth. And so we did see the 10-year Treasury increase about 80 basis points or 0.8% uh, in yield from the end of the year uh, to the end of March. So the yield on the 10-year Treasury was about 0.9%. As of 12:31, and it's about 0.1 or 1.7 percent as of the end of March. So historically, those are still very low rates, uh, but that's a that's a pretty meaningful move off of a less than one percent base over a three-year period, a three-month period. And part of that is driven by con uh, uh, concepts or uh, concerns around the potential for inflation. And uh, when we think about where yields are today, we do think that we're we're getting close to the intermediate peak, uh, assuming inflation follows our, our base case, which we'll talk more about in a minute. But we did see yields move pretty significantly uh, off of that bottom. And they've sort of stabilized here in the, in the 165, 175 range here over the last several weeks. Uh, and that, that could be good news if we just sit here for a while, but that's a, that's a pretty stark increase uh, in the slope of the, the, uh, the yield curve. So what does that mean to inflation? Well, the, the, you can see, uh, I'll stay out of the wonkiness of this, but basically when the blue line and the green line diverge, it means uh, short-term and long-term expectations have uh, diverged. And what this suggests is that over, over the last month of the quarter, or excuse me, this is as of, of March 8th. So in the midst of the quarter, we started to see uh, market participants uh, start to price in an intermediate spike or a short-term spike in inflation. And that's not terribly hard to consider if you think about just this notion of pent up demand. Uh, I'm sure your families, uh, potentially your families, have had the same conversations that mine have is that we're all itching to go somewhere, we're all itching to get away on, on holiday. And uh, it could be at some point, it could be very difficult to find a hotel room. And if you do, it, it might be quite expensive. So those are inflationary factors. And certainly if we're all out driving more and we're all out away from home, more demand for gas means higher gas prices. And so we could see and do expect to see a short-term blip in inflation driven primarily by pent-up demand. But we do think today as a base case that we're more likely to return back to inflation trend after this period is over. You know, maybe it's 12 to 24 months of inflation. And certainly the Fed has indicated that they're going to allow short-term inflation to uh, perhaps run much hotter than it had in the past, since inflation has really not been an issue for most people uh, in their lives. Uh, I, I probably was in single digits in terms of age the last time inflation, uh, inflation was meaningful in the US, uh, and I'm not so young anymore. So that, that was a good long time ago. Uh, so I think it's going to be a new experience, and I think the Fed will be uh, the opportunities or the potential for a policy mistake uh, could occur uh, as we just deal with things that that these generations of policymakers have not dealt with uh, either since they were very early in their careers or perhaps never in their careers. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, we do think that the, uh, there is return to trend for inflation. Uh, therefore, we're not making remarkable changes in our investment portfolios uh, to deal with any runaway inflation uh, fears or expectations over the next few, uh, next you know, call it year or two. Uh, we, we are maintaining exposure to real assets where we have them. We're continuing to invest in real assets from our, our, in those portfolios that do privates. Uh, equities over longer periods of time uh, do pretty well against inflation. So we're, uh, most of the portfolios have a very meaningful equity allocation. So we don't feel like there's a lot different that we need to do today. We're just making sure that we are near our targets, uh, making sure that we have our exposures so that we are participating in this movement as inflation works its way through the system. If something changes, uh, if there's a policy error, if there's some other factor that leads to uh, long-term inflation, if you remember back to the 70s, the notion back then was inflation being driven by institutionalized wage increases. If we see that, that could be a factor or will be a factor that we'll evaluate to see if we, if we change our base case view and if we then ultimately need to change the way that we invest in the portfolios. But as of today, uh, we just don't see those factors yet, uh, but we continue to watch and plan accordingly. So we'll transition excuse me, we'll transition from the, from the broader markets. We'll talk about the building blocks results for the quarter. Uh, just as a reminder, of course, these are custom building blocks for your portfolios and we use them across the complex. Uh, absolute returns, as you might imagine, if we, after looking at the absolute returns for the markets, our absolute returns for uh, all of the, uh, basically everything that we invest here on the first page uh, between equities and, and liquid real assets. These are all really stocks, just of different flavors. And you can see that by and large returns anywhere from just shy of 2% all the way up to uh, you know around 10% or so for our natural resources index. The uh, From an active management perspective, also really pretty good active management across the board. Uh, our three primary traditional equity uh, LLCs all outperform their policy indexes for the quarter. Uh, the uh, led really by what has been the star of the show uh, since original funding, the non-US equity portfolio outperformed by almost two full percentage points. Two full percentage points of outperformance in the emerging markets equity. Uh, great participation across the board in both of those portfolios, including really solid performance from the underlying value managers, as well as admirable performance from the more growth oriented positions in a period where, as we saw, growth went a bit out of favor. So even good solid outperformance amongst those managers whose style was out of favor, that really helped contribute to strong excess returns uh, for the quarterly period. And you can see over the last year, uh, while our US equity is still behind, uh, we're participating overall, uh, but good premiums from both non-US and emerging markets, as well as uh, in the diversified long-term growth pool, we do own the global opportunity strategy. Uh, underperformed some in the first quarter, really a bit of mean reversion, uh, but uh, on the back of quite significant one-year returns of 81% uh, with uh, a quite substantial premium versus the global stock market. So we're uh, pretty happy with the, with the uh, positioning that we have today. Uh, we are looking at a couple of things within portfolios, so we can't, uh, we can't get complacent. And there are some things that we'll you know, make some modest adjustments on. But overall, really pretty happy with the, the implementation we've gotten over the last quarter uh, and that we've received over the last year as we've gone through and made some changes in these equity portfolios. Fixed income and, and, and the hedge fund strategies also perform really pretty solidly. Uh, uh, with the, I suppose, let me say that differently. The hedge fund portfolio had a really pretty solid return up about one and a half percent. That's about what we'd expect with its kind of exposures in this environment and up nearly 20 over the one year period. Uh, so good solid returns in the, uh, in the uh, diversified long-term growth strategy. We do own hedge funds in lieu of owning more fixed income. And so these kinds of returns are really what we're hoping for when we get these kinds of returns out of our fixed income portfolio. So we did underperform a little bit in fixed income for the quarter. Uh, if you'll remember, I noted uh, investment grade bonds, investment corporate bonds, some other of those uh, categories that are not treasuries, uh, underperformed a bit more in the quarter. That leads us to some underperformance here. But those those sectors and allocations were instrumental in the close to six full percentage points of excess return 
from the fixed income portfolio over the last year. Uh, so we're uh, rarely happy to see that. Uh, a year ago this time, the fund was underperforming. It had taken it on a bit on the chin, uh, but really participated nicely, hanging in there uh, and ultimately generating excess returns. And then we do have a low duration allocation in the portfolio as well. We did, uh, we have taken the duration down a bit at the margin uh, as we as interest rates have gone up. So that's added some value just from an asset allocation perspective. And then Sterling, who is our uh, short duration fixed income manager, also posting a really pretty nice one year premium versus their benchmark. So when we translate that to the standard pools, uh, overall, really pretty happy with the outcomes. <laughs> Excuse me, you can see uh, with the exception of you know, fixed income, which was difficult on its own, as we just talked about, the more diversified portfolios have performed pretty nicely. So the income and growth, which of course is just 40% equity, 60% bonds, up about 1% with a nice premium versus its benchmark for the quarter. Passive long-term growth is 75% equity, 25% bonds, uh, right in line with its benchmark for the year. This gives you a sense of what a passive version of active long-term growth and diversified long-term growth might look like. Uh, because equities were up pretty strongly, active long-term growth outperformed a little bit versus uh, diversified for the quarter, uh, but both strategies generating nice premiums versus their policy indexes for that quarterly period. Uh, and as we transition and look at the um, one-year returns, you can see really pretty nice premiums across the board for the active-oriented strategies. Uh, it's nice to see we did hit a rough patch there through 2019 and into 2020, but with the adjustments we've made and, and then the confidence in managers that we have kept in place, we have started to generate some nice premiums. You know, these are probably bigger for full percentage points of premium and income growth strategy probably is well above expectations, but you saw how the fixed income portfolios outperformed over the last year. And that's really most of that outperformance. So, well, we'll take it. Uh, those kinds of 4% spreads are probably a little bit out of the ordinary, but you know, still good solid execution uh, and good uh, participation along with our expectations across the standard pools. So we're, uh, we're pretty confident in the way that we're positioned today. We are modestly overweight in things like emerging markets and small cap as we do think economic recovery continues and that those, those securities uh, will do well. Some of that's been priced in. We have some seen some rotation in the marketplace, but we have very, we have modest overweights. So if we, uh, the definition of modest for us is we might have a 10% target to emerging markets long-term. We are sitting at about 12. So we're just at two percentage point overweight, uh, trying to hit singles and doubles uh, to uh, generate the kinds of returns that you need to support uh, those causes in your community that you'd like to uh, support. So with that, I will pause and uh, invite Ian back, Ian and Greg to back with me and uh, we'll do some uh, Q&A. All right, Travis, thanks so much. Uh, great, great job as always. Uh, we had a few questions come in. Uh, we'll start with the first one. Do you have a time frame or under what conditions need to occur to move back into active management in the US equity LLC? So it's a good question, I think. Uh, we're still pretty active. So today we're about 75, to, uh, we're, we're underweight US large cap a little bit in the, in the portfolio today, we'll call it 70, 75% in US large cap. That is all passive today. And then we have the low volatility and the two small mid managers and those are active. Uh, I can see us at the margin adding to active over time. Uh, it's something though that we, we continue to talk about and think about because Active large cap is a tough thing. It's, it's a tough place to generate consistent excess returns. Uh, and even if you have what you believe to be a good manager, if you get out of favor with that manager, or if they happen to have a short uh, patch of underperformance, it can be tough to make that up uh, and, and tough to live with that at the total portfolio level. So it's something we continue to actively uh, discuss. Uh, we have some at large cap managers that we do like and that, and that have added value. Uh, but they also tend to be much more concentrated, can have a little bit more variability relative to the benchmark, which can make them tougher to own. Uh, but it's something that we actively review. Today, given general positive economic, uh, our views on having a generally positive economic view, uh, it's just harder in general to outperform uh, when stocks are going up very strongly. 
the, the index generally wins in those environments unless you're in you happen to be concentrated in the one strategy that is or one style that is winning uh, uh, while we have that view i think it is much more likely that we'd increase the active or add to active large cap in the u.s portfolios today uh, just because the the historically the environment for active managers in that kind of situation is not is not great uh, but it's something we continue to look at thanks John. we had one more come in um, what are your views on the act, the growth versus value debate? Uh, how do you think values uh, recent outperformance we've seen year to date? Uh, do you think that's sustainable? And uh, how do you feel about growth persistent outperformance over time? So I'll take the first one first because I think it's easier. Uh, you know, the we've seen we have seen you know, value got a really nice relief rally. It started a little bit in in. Uh, in the early fall, but a really nice value relief rally uh, with the advent of the vaccine release. And we've just seen value stocks perform extraordinarily well since then. However, the market uh, investors over the last three months have taken back some of that premium. So we saw value leadership really peak in mid-March. Uh, and then there's been some consolidations and profit taking in those names uh, since then. On a year-to-date basis, value is still ahead uh, and we would expect that to continue to be the case. Uh, I think the bigger question is, is will it, is there another big spread rally available uh, as the economy continues to unfold? I'm just not sure of that. Uh, we do, you know, we think value is attractive and, and uh, but we are pretty neutral in portfolios right now uh, to our long-term views, which means uh, in the US portfolio, we're, uh, we're about neutral to value in the non-US portfolios, we have just a modest overweight to value or a modest bias. It's not even really an overweight. It's a modest bias from a factor perspective to value in those portfolios. And that's certainly helped in the short term. Uh, I don't know if the, the spread on growth and value will be what it was for the last six months, for the next six months or the next two years. Uh, but to the extent the economy continues to expand and grow, there still should be some upside for earnings expansion from those more those those companies that are either more highly leveraged or more highly leveraged to uh, to the economy, the you know the 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 notion of growth you know extended growth outperformance. Uh, I'm in my 26th or 27th year in the investment business, and you know over much of that time, the 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 view was value outperforms over long periods of time. The unfortunate thing is those long periods of time are just getting longer to measure it. Uh, you know, it's. I think it is difficult to say that this time is different, so I won't. Uh, I think there's some potential advantages to, you know, big companies with moats around their businesses, and I think we've seen those kinds of businesses perform. We saw them perform very well coming into 2020. So the big cap growth names, they were just, you know, they're great businesses. They generate a lot of cash. Uh, they are absent further regulation. Many of them are uh, either monopolies or oligopolies. Uh, you know, these are these are concise industries, and and they're quite profitable. And so, you know, you know how much how much valuation premium do you pay uh, in a low rent rate, low interest rate environment for those? You know, up until the you know November of this last year, you paid the market was willing to pay quite a handsome price. Uh, uh, valuation for those companies because they were just better businesses in many ways than other companies were. Uh, you know, it, it remains to be seen what the next round of those or what next cadre of those types of businesses might be, or whether you can get sustained earning growth in thing in value type companies to change that tilt back. We we don't know well enough right now to make a bet, so uh, that's why we're positioned the way that we are. Uh, and I think those can be those can be extraordinarily difficult bets to get right anyway. Uh, looking at a at a secular change like that, but I mean it's as long as interest rates are low, it's going to make some of those long duration type stocks things like a uh, you know a I don't have a personal view on Google, but it's just sort of the poster child of that kind of com company. Low overhead, low fixed costs, huge margins, and tremendous free cash flow. You know, an environment where bonds don't pay very much, you can get pretty comfortable with a, a stock like that, uh, just characteristically. I'm not giving you advice to buy Google by any stretch, but just using it as an example. Travis, did we lose you? 
Oh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, we, we lost you there for a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully you got all my answer. Can you hear me in? You there? Yeah. Oh. Um, I tell you what, Travis, I can hear you. And uh, I don't think we had any more questions come in. Uh, so we'll go ahead and conclude the webinar. Um, thanks to both you and Tim for being with us today. We definitely appreciate it. And uh, thank you to all the participants. Um, obviously, we hope you found this webinar informational. And as we said at the outset, we will be posting a recording uh, to our website uh, as soon as possible. So thank you very much for attending and hope the rest of your week goes well. Thank you. Thank you all.